All right. Good morning, everyone, or good whatever time it is, wherever you are. Um, thank you for joining this session um, of the Pan Africanism, Pan Africanism or Parish um, Conference. My name is Nefer Freeman. Um, I'm. I apologize for having to give this recording to you because I can't. I can't participate directly in person or, um, or, or live rather, um, because I'm out of the country right now. I'm actually in Revolutionary Nicaragua, and uh, but I'm going to do the best I can to give this presentation by video. Hopefully, the the, um, the internet will hold out for us. Um, and hopefully that you'll appreciate what we're going to do here. To make it a little bit more uh, interactive, the, the topic of this one is community control and building a transition program for power. And to make it a little bit more interactive and not just boring so that I'm talking, it's just me talking, I have a comrade here, Chris Bernadette, who's going to sit in, listen to what I have to say, scrutinize it, interrogate it, whatever. And welcome to ask any questions he he has i'm i'm going i'll repeat what he has to say because he couldn't be on the actual on the zoom with me by zoom so i might have to just so you can hear anything he has to say i might have to repeat it um so let's just get started i think uh, maybe the first thing i think that has to be understood um maybe i want to unpack the the title of the the work the session community control and building a transitional program for power. And so the, the concept and you saw in the description that we were asserting that all politics are local. That means, you know, how people's lives are impacted, that the policies and decisions and the enforcement of things um, or the participation rather, uh, and if it's not oppressive of things happens on a local level. It happens where people are and where people are interacting with each other and that it stems outwardly from to a, a broader um, a broader ethos, if you will, um, to, to become more powerful. But all politics have a local impact, a path, and past deliberation, African liberation, depend on the projects, um, on projects of community control. Um, and that community control and structures for community control should be serving as dual power structures, a prerequisite to mass and international strategies for self-determination. Dual power structures, meaning that they are contending for power, particularly they are offering the people, in this instance, we're, we're living in a world, most of the world is dominated by white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy, and that people having to navigate that world, uh, most people are oppressed by it, and that there are institutions of power, they're they're, they're facilitated, maintained by the state, by state apparatuses, wherever we are, um, by the governments, wherever we are. And that um, if we're going to overthrow these oppressive, the oppressive systems, uh, the systems that oppress us, we have to contend for power and we have to create alternatives and we have to attack the legitimacy of, this, of the institutions of the state. Um, because a lot of it is people complying with certain things because we either have no alternative because they enforce force us or we have no alternative but to go to the dependent on them for something. Um, and so we want what dual power means is we're creating alternatives where people don't have to go to them and that people can also see a better alternative than what the, the oppressive system provides to them at the current moment and that eventually the idea is not just to stay there and to be this alternative that coexists with the state or the oppressive ruling system, but to actually depose the rulers. And actually the, the dual power structure that we create are structures of community control and the institutions that, that are people-centered institutions that are emerging out of our projects are, um, they are, they, they serve and they have to depose. Uh, replaced. They're the embryo of the world that we want to see and the system that we want to put into place. So that's how we see it. Um, so just to give a little bit of background on the reemergence of the calls for community control, they gained steam in the mobilizations and protests of the murder of Michael Brown uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, 2014, um, by, by, that, by the cop, killer cop, Derek 
Darren Chau- Derek Chauvin, I think his name was. No, if I'm, am I matching that up with George Floyd? What's the George? Am I, I can't remember. No, no, uh, Michael Brown. George Floyd's, I can't remember which one. I'm, I'm, that's Derek Chauvin, not George, not Derek Chauvin. The, I can't remember the, I can't remember that cop's name. But anyway, it was, it was similar um, in a lot of ways. But anyway, um, there's so many of them. But anyway, so the emergence for, we saw calls for, you know, all kinds of things, body cameras, whatever, reform the police, they create all the Black Lives Matter mobilizations, as we call them. But in there, uh, they didn't get enough, uh, this, that, just getting more attention, but there were calls for community control over the police. That, that started with the, the progenitors of community control over police, where the Black Panther Party for self-defense, uh, realizing that we need to, to be able to defend ourselves from the occupying forces known as the police occupying forces of our community uh, that are that are facilita- uh, enforcing white supremacy capitalism and patriarchy enforcing basically settler colonialism if we talk about the united states uh, but of course this this situation exists in a lot of places where black people are um, and so that's where the the gain the reemergence of it in the u.s has gained steam now um, but it's in, it's in contending with uh, calls also for uh, uh, defunding the police and abolishing the police. I should say was contending with it because we're not hearing anything about defund or abolish police anymore. They were, and I'm just going to make it, keep it plain, keep it real. They were inadequate and, and foolish demands that the enemy was able to discredit and now um, doing the opposite refunding the police more and, and beefing up police um, and making it seem through their media as if the abolishing of police was ridiculous. Now, we don't think it was ridiculous. In fact, the police, the whole the extension, the, the, the police is an extension of the state are just one aspect that needs to be uh, abolished and we should say transform the, their police as we know it. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about the United States or the neo-colonial uh, places like in, in Nigeria or whatever. Uh, we want to, you know, those the system and the state that supports the system has to be abolished and the police is just one aspect of it. Um, so I think it's first important, I'm gonna, you know, the, uh, my man Chris right here can, can I'm gonna say he can interject at any point as I'm talking, um, he's going to actually replace you all as the audience. He's going to serve as the, what do you call it? Um, what's the word I want? Anyway, like a, a, a audience. Um, surrogate. Surrogate audience. Is that the right word? Anyway. Anyway, so um, he agreed and said, said yes. I want to start with also trying to define some of these. Uh, Define terms. I won't call it defined, but get a couple of things straight. And a lot of the concepts and things I'm using are um, from Pan African Community Actions Tools of Analysis. That's the basis of this presentation. Um, and we want to make it clear that a lot of the references may be to the U.S. Africans in the U.S. in our situation, but they are they can be universally universally applicable with a little bit of uh, considerations for ch- some specific changes or some, you know specific uh, changes in form. The essence is the same. Um, so one thing is that we want to make clear in terms of this part is definitely U.S. Uh, U.S experience is that black communities in the U.S. are a domestic colony. A lot of people don't think of them as that way, whether you are in the U.S. or outside of the U.S., you think of the U.S. as black Americans and African Americans and, and that we are part of this, this system, even if you believe it's oppressive, it's, some, it's a system that has to be improved, so to speak, and we're part of that improvement. But we, we assert that we're a black community, we're a domestic colony, and these are our descriptions of it right here. We are domestic, we are colonized people inside the United States, and the police serve as an occupying army to enforce that colonial relationship. It's the same thing that police under neo-colonial situations anywhere else in the world where African people are, even on the continent of Africa, they might not be a domestic colony, but they are subjects of neo-colonialism. And this is we wanna, so we have a particular relationship here. So settler colonial, uh, the US is settler colony, and we have to remember that, and that indigenous and African people who are forced to be in a situation are, uh, have interests diametrically opposed to those who benefit from them. 
from this situation. The other thing is the core issue is power and not racism. A lot of times we think that the, the police killing us and all this stuff, the racist cops and the, the institution of police is racist. And that even if it's not just police, uh, even if it's other issues within that we face as African people in particular, we attribute it to racism and we want to fight and abolish racism. But we say it's not racism, it's power. And that we cannot change our reality. I'm reading right here. We cannot change our reality by ending racism or the attitudes and opinions of others that others hold of us. Our conditions will only change when we shift power into our own hands and exercise self-determination, thereby rendering the opinions of other of racists irrelevant. And so I, I, it reminds me of a quote that Kwame Ture used to say, um, that if a, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. It's, if he has the power to lynch me, then that's my problem. So in other words, people can walk around with all kinds of sentiments in their heads about Africans or whatever, but it's not, that's not the problem. The problem is when they, when the, the configuration of and dispositions of power allow them to do it with impunity and then and also some kind of collective, uh, some kind of collective force. Um, and so that's why we say it's power. And so we want to, we want to deal with power. Um, so that's, that's, uh, one thing we wanted to get straight. And so community control uh, um, is, and particularly is, is we want to make it clear, it's, it's antithetical to reformism. Not reforms, it is a reform, and you can explain it, but it's not, it's, re, it's antithetical to reformism. That means that people, you know, uh, uh, approaching social change is something where you just think around the edges, you don't want to fundamentally transform or, uh, 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 yeah, transform or abolish the system and replace the system. You just want to make it better, you know. And that's that's a reformist and reformism. But reforms in itself are are just basically changes of policy. Um, and that if part of a larger, broader, long term, dare I say, long term strategy, they can actually be revolutionary. And what what can is the most telltale sign of a reform not being reformist and being revolutionary is when it shifts power to the hands of the oppressed. Community control of the police is a perfect one. So if we've taken the, this power over policing and self, self uh, public safety and all that over the community and putting it in the hands of the community as opposed to the state, as opposed to the, the ruling class that controls the state, um, then that's power shifting. Right. It's not a reform. It's, it's, it's different than these things like community policing and police review boards that don't change anything. They're non-binding. They don't have any give any power to people. Um, and so and they're basically a bait and switch to, to people's con, um, concerns. Chris, you wanted to raise something? Yeah, so you mentioned the police and changing Yeah, that's a good question. So um, Chris just asked me if there's a fundamental difference between changing the police and then changing the the institutions that, 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 uh, to, and the practice of the policing. Yes. So um, he said a little bit more than that, but that's the essence of the question. And so, and that's a good question. And so the difference is, so a lot of times when people think of, um, and we're talking about community control in the broader, broadest sense, but we're using the, uh, the one institution, the police, as a as a um, example. And so the, a lot of people think of community control over the police as the community having some jurisdiction over the agents of the state to carry guns and occupy our neighborhoods and drive around in cars and can shoot us, whatever, that we would be able to be their bosses and tell them what to do as opposed to the police chief and the mayors and the cities being able to be their bosses and tell them what to do. That's not the concept. Uh, the concept is that, at least for us, and I think it's the same with the, but it's been the same with the Black Panthers and a lot of this mis misunderstood, is that we would we would create a situation where we're basically, and I guess it will make it clear in these these terms. We would basically be assuming through our organized force, through our ability to organize in mass, um, community control or, or the ability to, to 
set policy, set duties, set priorities, set qualifications, so, uh, define what the consequences are for misconduct of, of people that we define uh, as, or that we uh, in, um, grant the power to do what we think of as policing and, and, and community public safety. This is a situation where you know, we could define it any way we want. We would effectively be expelling the police out of our community and, and implementing and deploying a force that we have defined, reimagined and re-envisioned. And then sometimes we say in Paca that, the, that the, the concept that the people will come up with in this instance would be so radically different than what we know as the police that we would be forced to change the name. And in fact, effectively in that instance, we would be abolishing the police, you know? And we, we say, when people talk about abolishing the police, well, we say, you can't abolish anything that you can't control. So if you ain't talking about controlling it, but you wanna abolish it, you ain't, you know, I don't know how that's gonna happen. Um, and so, but that's the answer. Does that answer your question? Um, and so, so yeah, and then, so it's not trying to, you know, assume control over the extensions of the state is trying to uh, get rid of that, uh, about expel it from our communities, or at least you know attack its jurisdiction, its its authority, um, its legitimacy in our communities. Um, and we say legitimate attacking legitimacy. In other words, we want people. We have to get to the. We have to reach the hearts and minds of our people who are already dissatisfied in a lot of ways. You know, the working class African communities. And it's even, you know, on the continent of Africa, we're dissatisfied with police, but they don't have any place else to go if they're in danger or if they whatever, you know, it's set up, the system set up where people don't have anything else. So we want to create an alternative. And that's where the dual power structure comes in. Dual power comes in is that we, we create something that people begin to have faith in and will call on, they will prefer it over the institution of police and therefore, therefore challenging their legitimacy. And so Chris asked me, he said that the, the, the term or the concept of dual invokes uh, that these will be institutions that are coexisting and and contending for power at, at the same time. They're co coexisting and contending for power, um, and that's exactly what it is. And some people think of the co coexisting, but they don't think of the contending for power <laughs> situation. And that the, the and that's important because it's not that it means that we it's not something we want to create that it will live it, and that's the that's the end of it. Its, its specific purpose is to depose the rules and replace the system with the system that we invoke. That's what we, I think we mentioned earlier. I don't know if this was part of the, I mentioned earlier that what we're creating is the embryo of the system that we wanna see. We wanna create an example or microcosms of it. We wanna create liberated zones that eventually connect with each other and to connect with each other and, and become more mass at, uh, in, in particularly community control. And this goes for any institutions, whether they be child protective services or anything, Con community control over education, community control over healthcare, community control over all the institutions we must interact with on a regular basis. And that we challenge them also the legitimacy through, uh, the, through the legal, the established legal system in a way, so the ballot initiative. We don't want some city council people or whatever voting for it in, that this is our position. Our position is that we want to have, we want to, take it to the ballot. We want, we want people to have to, one, it does another thing, it increases, we already have to be organized, but increases or it solidifies our, our uh, having to go to the people and organize with the people and engage with the people and politically educate the people. People must be politically educated to what the, the systems are that oppress us and what these alternatives are that we are creating. Um, and so the ballot initiative means you got to collect signatures, you got to campaign, you know, and so even if we take things to the ballot and it's some kind of community control initiative and we lose the ballot initiative for some reason, we've still won in the sense that we built our forces, we've collected, you know, you know, engaged with people and made contact with people. Um, that we could take that further. And if we are doing the proper work of 
uh, these institutions, these people-centered institutions, um, and we call them people-centered because they, they, there's something that emerges out of the struggles of the people as opposed to anything else. Then if we're doing that, then we've, we've won, we've advanced the struggle, even if we didn't actually win the ballot, the ballot initiative, but we can also win the ballot initiative. And the ballot initiative would expel, you know, that would legally mean we have the legal right to exercise uh, you know, overall jurisdiction, you know, the, our education system, our health system, all that type of thing that comes out of the, the people, the masses of the people. Um, we gave an example earlier, and I just want to get this and run out of time. But one of the things about the, when we make it clear about the agents, and I think this goes back to your original question too, the, when it comes to policing, we use the, the example of the establishing our own qualifications of who is police, right? And that this is what really makes it clear. Under the state's police, you can't be uh, convicted of what they determine a crime. And I say, because to me, you know, just because you broke a law don't mean you're immoral or you something, because a lot of laws are immoral, so that doesn't mean anything. We don't measure it that way. But their thing is they, they measure certain things that way. And if you're if you're accused or convicted of any kind of crime, you've had conviction, then you can't become a police officer. For us, we might think, well, we have different priorities. We have, we're trying to look at preventative measures and not, not just punitive things and not just protecting property and all that. But we are, we might say, well, we want to stop the turf wars, the beefs uh, in our community. And some of the best people, best qualified to do that, maybe have been there already are older now, have been through something, and including prison, are, are returning citizens. So we might look to them as people have been qualified to either become what we define as, we have redefined as police, and or also helping us establish the, the program and the training program and what we need to equip ourselves with in order to, to address this particular issue. Chris? So one of the things in the East that I is the issue of intercommunal violence. And you did mention a few things that you did tell us how we put intercommunal violence on the different kind of systems you're imagining. Mm -hmm. um, now, did I talk about influence and power yet? I might not have done that because I was doing it before, but let me. Do, so, Chris was asking me about examples of intercommunal violence and well, I said one of the issues. One of the issues. Of the community, That's a great question. So he said that a lot of times our people uh, uh, with their concerns bring up uh, issues of intercommunal violence. You know, a lot of times the system will try to, you know, <laughs> to denigrate us and call it black on black crime. <laughs> but we're, you know, but there is, we're not under any illusions that our oppressive, the oppressive conditions we face do foster uh, intercommunal violence, things that happen with us, you know, gang wars and drugs and, you know, and beef over drugs and different stuff like that. And so the approach for us, and you asked about what approach, to, how the approach would be different, a revolutionary approach, people centered revolutionary approach. Um, this this part of a dual power structure versus them is that you know the state you know everything is they're the other you know people engaged in that are the other and they are huh the the, the neo colonial occupiers though they they deem those who engage in commun in the communal violence or they will they will criminalize people who we we need to be embracing as part people part of our community I know that's tough. And we, you know, especially if you've been the, on the receiving end of some kind of violence, but the fact is we're not an inferior people. These things don't happen because we just run around here inferior and don't know how to get along. These things happen because of the conditions that we face. And if we're to mitigate those conditions, we got to start at the root. We have to deal with what uh, the frustrating conditions or whatever, even just, you know, sometimes they're not frustrating. Sometimes somebody's, and but most of the time they are that foster this stuff uh, in the community. So for example, so for example, and I kind of just dealt with it, the, the police that we deploy would go and they're much like the, the what they're calling violence interrupters now. 
um, but they, they really are working with them a lot. So we're talking about revolutionary violence interrupters who will be able to, you know, to intervene, but also, um, but also maybe do it in parts of revolutionary knowledge or whatever. Maybe I should use a different example, like for example, domestic violence. Um, so domestic violence, we would, you know, we, we wouldn't, you wouldn't come guns blazing and ready to, and you surely wouldn't leave an abuser in the home or, you know, able to do something uh, to the person that's being abused, continue it and just come and, you know, walk away. Sometimes the police just like, oh, it's, you know, especially some of the patriarchal police will just be like, this is an internal, you know, issue. And I don't want to also assume that violence, there's not uh, different forms of, uh, of domestic violence where even a man could be the subject, you know, the, on the receiving end or something. But that's not really the point. The point is how do we, in, the intervening of it wouldn't just by uh, police so that they, it would be different in a sense that we would have to look at the root causes of this type of behavior and people who would go in, um, people would go in, one, they would have to have a, what do you call it, um, some inter, some immediate relief, like uh, they would be able, they'd have to stop it uh, immediately. And that, um, you know, I, I really am not equipped to really to talk about this, but one of the things, the best answer to your question is that we would convene specialists in the community who already work on this and know all about it from the psychological point of view and everything to figure out what the, the priorities and the approaches and the duties of the police would be in that situation. I'm not a specialist in it, so I just don't even need to try to answer it. It would be foolish for me to do that. But we do know, in fact, that's one of the things we could, we have a whole lot of people that we can convene uh, that are specialized in certain aspects that we have to deal with that the, the, the police don't consult anyway. Right now, the state's police don't consult them. They surely don't take any directives from them. And, and they might pretend to do some PR stuff, but that's it. That would be the example. Now, let me get into, I think I'm, I'm running out of time. So I wanted to talk about defining power because we said the core issue is, is power, not racism. But I think it's important for us to define power. Um, and because, you know, that's kind of the, because we, this is a transitional program for power. So a lot of people confuse um, influence with power. And that's what we're taught to do it. Be an activist and write your congressperson or march on them, direct action, do a direct action and, and to go to their house and get them to do what you want them to do and target the people that you want. That's, you know, what do they call it? Social change one-on-one, uh, grassroots organizing one-on-one type tactics, right? Well, what you're, you're not exercising power. We're told that all the time. Exercise your power. You're exercising influence. You're exercising influence against or over people who have the power. They have the power. They're implementing. They're doing things. This is, a, this is our definition of power. The ability to implement or enact an idea, belief, will, opinion, plan, or decision, and the capacity to protect the outcome. So they're the ones implementing, doing the implementation. They're the ones doing the enacting. And a lot of times it's their own ideas and beliefs and opinions and not ours, but most times. And even if they are doing ours, they might tweak it a little bit or whatever, but they're damn sure not going to do it in a way, in any kind of way that weakens the system. So, but we want to replace the police. So that's why we also say things like community control and being organized for community control over any institution is actually a power shifting demand. It takes the power out of the hands of the state or the ruling, you know, the ruling classes that the government that control the state or or, or can, yeah, control the state and puts it in the power in the hands of the people. So it's a reform that one, you know, doesn't need anything else after that. Once you, you know, and um, so our fight is just at the bottom. Our fight is for power and community control, self determination, not inclusion. When you're fighting for inf influence. You're fighting for inclusion and accept. You're legitimizing the system. You're saying it needs to exist, and I just we just want to change it a little bit, and we want to be part of it, and that's it. And so that's what influence does. When you're fighting for power, you're trying to depose the rulers, and so that's what we want to do: depose the rulers, um, and replace the, and, and create the embryo of the system that we want to see. We're we're doing a revolutionary, uh, creating a revolutionary act. And don't be fooled 
they don't want, they're not going to turn over lightly, even though that even if we win this, some ballot initiatives on something, they're not going to be like, okay, they won their ballot initiative. Let's, you know, go home. No, nah, they're going to try to think of something else. And that's how we have to be. We also have to go back to thinking about how do we defend uh, and protect the capacity, you know, have the capacity to protect the outcome of our decisions, the outcome of our plans and our programs that we implement. Um, and that's part of, that's part of, that's power. Um, so they have the power to protect. They got the army, they got the police, you know, that's power. And so um, I think, let me make sure I'm not, um, oh, I didn't get to this, this, this is a thing a comrade of mine, com uh, community action, Pan-African Community Action put together. One of the, it's just, it talks about, yeah, I'm running out of power. Uh, so it talks about, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Venn diagram that deals with creating a solidarity economy and its relationship to uh, leading into transformative justice, transformative justice leading into cultural revolution and then the cultural revolution into dual power and dual power to again looping into the solidarity economy and strengthening it um, to where we can actually, um, yeah, uh, fight for power. So let me, I think I'm gonna, um, I gotta go back to these notes and make sure it was, a, it was an example really quickly that uh, an example, we're in Nicaragua right now. And one of the things that was interesting was when they, when they described to us, so. Okay, let me, let me back up, sorry. Two things that I want in my notes that I see I need to mention. Mutual aid and survival programs are not meant simply as an alternative to the, to the domestic capitalist power structure. It's meant as a contending power, the embryo of the system succeeding a revolutionary transfer of power away from white supremacy capitalist patriarchy. The strategy starts on the local level to decisively contend for pa state power held by the colonized poor, black and brown working class while shattering the legitimacy and authority of the existing white supremacist capitalist patriarchy settler ruling class. And we were, again, we refer to settlers because we're talking about the United States in this instance, that's where they came from. So at the center of the process must be poor, poor working class, black and brown people. They should be at the center. They should be, you know, driving force if it's not similar to them, then we're gonna have some you know, class issues there that are gonna turn into reformism. Political education has to be at the center. At every level of political education has to be part of engaging the people. Last, I'm gonna go into this example in, in the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua was in 1979, but, and they had to fight this contra war that the US you know, waged against them. In 1990, they lost the election to, uh, to one of the parties to a, a neoliberal uh, party that was a popular in the United States from 1990 to 2006. In 1990, they actually uh, conceded their defeat. And uh, you know they, did, they had the power, they had the guns and everything, but they didn't use that to, to do it. This was their strategy. They conceded their defeat and they did what they called ruling from below. They used their political relationships with the people that they had already had and, and uh, sustained an alternatives to what was happening. Um, they, they, their concept is the elected seats, because here in the US, you know, people run of their own vocation. I'm gonna run for office. And then being a Democrat or Republican doesn't really mean much. They, they're aligned with, you know, capitalism and all that, and it's, uh, all those principles, but they also think the seat belongs to them. And that's how they act. And in here, they say the seat belongs to the people. So while I might have a person occupying a political position or a seat, it belongs to the people, part of the thing, uh, part of sustaining that position is belong to the people, is consulting the people in everything. So they don't just make decisions on their own, but they're consulting the people. They're convening them in, in people's assemblies and whatnot and consulting them. That's how community control has to work for anything. We have to consult the people, and they won the election in 2006 because people saw how they were carrying it. Um, and so again, that's the end of my, my talk. I hope this was, uh, was interesting people. We want to, uh, community control as a transitional program for building power, um, as a building of a transitional program for power. So we're building a transitional program while there's power going on that we want to depose and replace the, the, the um, the rules.
Okay, everybody, thank you for indulging me. I hope that was gratifying. Have a good conference.